Good morning, everyone. Good morning from Hong Kong. Uh, good, good afternoon or good evening to you, uh, depending on where you are around the world. Uh, um, so my name is Hao Chen. I am um, an associate professor teaching intellectual property and tech law at the University of Hong Kong. I am a co-organizer of this conference. Uh, we had a fantastic day yesterday. Uh, uh, we had a very exciting program. Uh, we, for example, Dr. Edward Kawakwa, Assistant De Director General of WIPO, delivered a keynote addressing uh, WIPO's role in containing the COVID-19 pandemic. Following his keynote speech, we had a panel uh, dealing with how to expand access to COVID-19 vaccines globally. Uh, we had uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, four distinguished speakers uh, dealing with uh, this critical issue. And uh, the second panel also explored uh, other means of promoting public health, especially uh, in dealing with uh, the current pandemic and any future pandemics. So we had a great day. And uh, today we are moving on to the second day's program, uh, starting with a keynote by Professor Terry Fisher and uh, his longtime collaborator, Ruth, Professor Ruth Arcadigy. So let me briefly introduce uh, Professor Terry Fisher. He deserves a very long in, uh, introduction, but uh, since we our time is limited and uh, I'm gonna uh, quickly introduce him uh, to the audience. Uh, and uh, so Terry is a towering figure in the, as you know, as a towering figure in the intellectual property uh, field, especially uh, in the uh, IP policy and theory uh, area. So he has contributed uh, you know, tremendously to the uh, IP theory uh, research. Uh, if you wanna write a, you know, an, a, a paper on IP theory, you have to, uh, I tell you, you have to cite his essay entitled Theories of Intellectual Property. If you wanna work on fair use, you have to cite his Harvard Law Review article, Re constructing fair use. And if you wanna work on uh, the entertainment industry and copyright, you have to cite his book, Promising to Keep Up. Um, and he has actually worked on many other issues. So given our time is limited, so I'm gonna uh, just uh, make uh, this brief introduction. And so, and um, at the same time, uh, we also have another keynote speaker who is, as I mentioned, who who is Professor Ruth Arcadigy. Um, uh, Professor Arcadigy has contributed significantly to the uh, development of intellectual, international intellectual property law, uh, ranging from access to knowledge, how to define copyright limitations in public interest to uh, access to um, uh, medicines and vaccines for the developing world. So we're tremendously honored and uh, fortunate to have them deliver today's keynote speech. Terry, please go ahead. Hao Chen, thank you so much for the gracious introduction. Um, as you indicated, this has been already a uh, remarkable conference. Uh, especially impressive has been the way in which the different presentations have fit together substantively and have reinforced one another. That's unusual in a conference. Uh, and I hope to continue that trend. Uh, it's also been a remarkable conference in the um, joint sponsorship between Georgetown and Hong Kong University. So I was uh, struck. Um, yesterday by uh, Dean Fu's um, powerful uh, suggestion that this conference is one piece, perhaps a small piece of the valiant uh, efforts by Hong Kong University to maintain traditions of um, academic freedom uh, in a, a political environment that is um, fraught uh, uh, it turns out all political environments are fraught these days, but Hong Kong is under a special pressure. Uh, so uh, 
for what it's worth. Um, I'm hoping uh, in the future to do whatever I can to assist in the university's uh, efforts to sustain its extraordinary tradition of quality and academic freedom. So with that, I'll turn to um, my presentation. Uh, for this, I'll be sharing the screen. So um, let's hope that this works. Let's see. So what I'll be presenting in the next half hour is a um, adaptation of an argument that um, three of us have developed in collaboration. Uh, Ruth Akedici, my uh, colleague, um, who is also um, participating in this uh, presentation. Um, Padmasri Gel Sampath, who is um, another collaborator, now um, a visiting professor at the University of Johannesburg. So the three of us put together this argument, which draws on our disparate um, backgrounds. It's available at the um, SSRN site, uh, indicated at the bottom of this page, in case you are curious. Okay, so um, I'm going to move through some background material fairly quickly because I anticipate that most of the participants in this conference are familiar with this um, argument, but I think it's important to have a sense of where local production, our topic today, fits into the overall analytical landscape. So life expectancy at birth in the world is currently uh, highly disparate. As you can see from the color scheme, there is a reasonably tight correlation between um, uh, gross national product and uh, life expectancy. And this is a moral uh, calamity. Why? Why is life expectancy so radically unequal throughout the world? Well, using the most recent WHO numbers, you can identify uh, what people die and suffer from throughout the world by region. So I'm going to show uh, on this chart some numbers, and specifically in each cell of this chart, the first number indicates the losses per year in thousands of dollars attributable to the cause at issue listed on the column A. Second number is the proportion of the global burden associated with that cause borne by the region. And the third, perhaps the most helpful number analytically is the number of dollars lost per 100,000 people. So, uh, so these are the numbers from the most recent WHO data. And you can quickly see that infectious and parasitic diseases and non-communicable conditions are the biggest causes of mortality and morbidity throughout the world. The biggest cause of the inequality uh, that's evident in the chart I showed in the beginning is um, this, infectious and parasitic diseases. The, uh, uh, this proportion is extreme between low income and high income countries. It appears at first, this is infectious and parasitic diseases. It appears at first that non-communicable conditions are more evenly spread throughout the world, uh, but that's only because these are um, uh, raw numbers. If you use age standardized uh, death rates, uh, the, the traditional pattern with uh, a few more complications reemerges. So I take it to be our common objective in this conference and in the initiatives that many of us are engaged in to alleviate these uh, two closely related uh, sources of the brutal inequality in the world today. To do that, we first need to identify the uh, causes, the underlying causes of that disparity. There are, <clears throat> roughly speaking, the following as the uh, principal um, underlying causes. First, inequality in the availability of sanitation and clean water, the quality of healthcare in the different countries and regions, the quality of education concerning health, the global distribution of vectors like mosquitoes, um, and last but not least, the availability of safe, effective, and affordable diagnostics, vaccines, and medicines. And this is what we're primarily focused on here. Uh, it's the 
aspect of this underlying problem over which we have um, at least partial control and for which we as uh, lawyers and lawmakers are to some extent uh, responsible. So we identify um, why safe, effective and affordable diagnostics, vaccines and medicines are unequally available. We can identify three intermediate causes. The first is that the combination of mechanisms that we currently employ to incentivize the development and distribution of new drugs tilts toward diseases available in the developed world and against those in the developing world. Next, law, meaning intellectual property and regulatory systems, plus the fragmentation of national markets interferes with sales of extant products, meaning the products that we do have at reasonable prices in low income in low and middle income countries. And um, perhaps less obviously, but equally important, unscrupulous manufacturers of medicines and inadequate controls of distribution channels and inadequate post market surveillance have led to a distressingly high percentage of falsified and substandard medicines uh, in the developing world, especially somewhere between, depending on country you're studying, um, 10 and 13% at a minimum. Okay, so what can we do about this? Um, well, different people on this call are pursuing a variety of initiatives and they are all going to be necessary. If we are going to uh, solve this problem. Uh, they include uh, donations like PEPFAR and Medicines Patent Pool, legal reform, which is a huge and very complicated field uh, that many of the participants in this conference have been pioneers in, uh, but we're not gonna be talking about today. And uh, last but not least, our focus, at least for this first panel, is on local production of pharmaceutical products in developing countries. Okay, that's the overall context. So currently, Manufacture of pharmaceutical products is heavily concentrated. Now, it's difficult to get uh, precise data on this, partly because the definition of manufacturer is complex in the pharmaceutical field. But this is one suggestive um, indicator. As you can see, if one looks to the permits that have been granted by F the FDA on the one hand and the EMA on the other, they are heavily concentrated in plants that are located in the United States, Europe, India, China, South Korea, and Japan, uh, and very few in the rest of the world, including in what we think of as the developing world. So should we increase the production of pharmaceutical products in the developing countries where they're going to be cons consumed. The traditional argument about this issue um, identifies two potential advantages of the local production. It will create many high paying skilled jobs and support sustainable economic development. And it will have health benefits because local firms will respond more quickly and flexibly to the changing health needs of the residents of each country. Those are the traditional arguments in favor of local production. The traditional arguments against it are that it forfeits economies of scale by parceling out manufacturing and thus it's less efficient and thus it will, other things being equal, raise the cost of medicine. And second, the systems for maintaining the quality of drugs are less robust in African countries and developing countries more generally and thus local production leads to an increase in substandard drugs. So that's the traditional debate. Recently, uh, three developments have augmented the arguments in favor of local production and muted the objections. And those recent developments are, as we discussed at some length yesterday, the emergence of new diseases in the last few years. Ebola has been around for about 30 years, but its huge surge came much more recently. And of course, the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic. 
Next, the scarcity of medicines that has become obvious in the last year and the associated pattern of vaccine nationalism upon which all of the speakers yesterday were agreed. And finally, the revelation of the scale of substandard drugs in uh, developing countries. Those three things together have created a much more powerful impulse to augment local production, to effectively combat the scourge of um, diseases in developing countries. So on the assumption that we agreed upon the goal, then the question is how to achieve it. So in the paper I mentioned um, at the outset of this talk, we examine uh, <clears throat> the history of efforts to augment local production in the developing countries in general and Africa in particular. And from that distill four lessons concerning the um, conditions under which local production is most likely to work. Two of them are obvious, legal authority to and manufacture the goods at issue in the country at issue. That's number one. And number three is money. You need money to manufacture it. Well, um, the other two are less uh, prominently featured in the literature. Number two is know-how. Uh, this was appropriately the focus of many of the presentations in the conference yesterday. Tech transfer, how to ensure that local firms have or are provided the skills necessary to engage in the production processes. And I'll be amplifying and adding to that analysis in the balance of this talk. Least obvious, but equally important is number four, reliable demand for the products uh, for local production of work. Turns out that you need in advance identification of a sizable set of customers who are ready and able to buy the firm's products. You might think this would be automatic, but it has not been historically. Okay, so to achieve this combination of conditions, we, in the article, advocate five tactics. And that's what I'll be talking about in the balance of my, let's see, in the next 20 minutes. The first one is clearing legal space. It's uh, crucial, as I've just indicated, that a local firm, considering engaging in local production, have legal authority to do so. Uh, where might such authority come from? Well, <clears throat> until recently, most of the initiatives of local production involved essential medicines that were already off patent. And so legal authority was no longer an issue. In addition, some of the more recent um, relevant vaccines um, are now subject to non-enforcement pledges by the holders of the patents in question. The most important for our purposes is, as indicated yesterday, Moderna. So in these two categories, we're clearing the legal space is uh, already been done for us. When it has not been done, when the drug at issue is subject to patent protection, then, um, as Director Kwakwa indicated yesterday, there is available a set of so-called TRIPS flexibilities that can be employed to clear adequate space for um, manufacturing and distributing the drug at issue. Uh, this, there's a big literature about all this, which we, in a forthcoming book, explore in some detail. The principal TRIPS flexibilities are listed in the column on the left of this chart. The one that is uh, most often treated as the central flexibility is compulsory licensing and parallel importation. Um, and indeed, that's the flexibility to which Director Quackwatt directed our attention yesterday. In our view, um, although it's true, that's an important flexibility, it's actually less important as a uh, practical matter than the others listed here, in the particular working requirements and uh, limiting remedies for patent infringement, following the lead, ironically, of the United States in curtailing the availability of injunctive relief and um, pressing downward on the ongoing royalties that would be uh, collectible by the patentee. So much more could be said on that front, and we may return to this issue in the Q&A. 
But for the time being, I want to turn to the argument presented by several of the speakers yesterday, we, um, the nub of which is we can't rely on TRIPS flexibilities as a way of clearing legal space because, number one, uh, many of the lawmakers in developing countries are unaware of exactly what their options are. And even more importantly, the um, developed countries of the world led sadly by the United States in this regard, typically punish exercises of these flexibilities uh, sufficiently severely as to discourage their invocation as um, Ellen Taun has indicated in a, a persuasive paper. So to ensure that the flexibilities are in fact available, we need two things. We need first education in uh, to ensure that policymakers of all sorts in developing countries are aware of the options available to them. Uh, so Professor Okedici and I have been working on this front for a while. Um, it grows out of an initiative that I started 10 years ago involving copyright law. Uh, so what's known as the Copyright X course aspires among other things to expand awareness of copyright uh, throughout the world. Um, it now includes the network of uh, institutions involved in this venture includes uh, the 23 listed in your screen of which 12 are located in uh, developing countries. Uh, so the aspiration of this was to expand awareness of the details of copyright law globally. And Professor Okedici and I, against the backdrop of this initiative have um, commenced a analogous venture vis-a-vis -vis patent law. So we've, we put it together and uh, this is the first set of teachers in this field. Uh, one of the main reasons we did this was to ensure that there was a program that would provide detailed information to uh, policymakers in developing countries concerning what their options were. Okay, so to facilitate usage of the TRIPS flexibilities, we need first education, which we're doing what we can to work on. We also need reform of the practices of the United States Trade Representative and analogous organizations in other developed countries. And specifically, the USTR should be obliged to adopt a non-retaliation principle of the sort we customarily use in a variety of other fields like civil rights. Um, in which exercises of legal powers uh, cannot be punished. Um, less obviously, we argue in our article that the USTR ought to have a duty to provide prospective guidance concerning the permissibility of proposed invocation of TRIPS flexibilities in much the same way that other executive agencies or branches of the executive currently provide ex ante guidance concerning what one can and cannot do, like the IRS and the FTC. So where would legal authority for this change in USTR practice come from? Well, you don't need to go further than the USTR's own formal interpretation of its statutory charge, which is much broader than its practice has been in recent years. Another practical advantage of this proposal is that um, it could be effected by the Biden administration without um, reliance on Congress. You don't need a statutory change for this. And as we all know, statutory changes in the United States are hard to come by these days. Okay, that's the first of our five recommendations about how to augment uh, local production of pharmaceutical products. Here's the second one. <clears throat> One should aspire to organize what we call production triangles, which are collaborations of three entities, uh, a pharmaceutical firm, an African manufacturing firm, and an African national government. Turns out that historically, uh, the successful, relatively modest number of successful initiatives in local production have all involved triangles of this sort. So the pharmaceutical firm provides a patent license, next and crucially tech transfer, and often assistance in establishing the plant in question. The African manufacturing firm provides uh, production of the goods, management and marketing locally, 
And equally important, the national government provides investment in the enterprise and purchasing power and an advanced purchase commitment, uh, which is crucial to get the enterprise off the ground. So for example, <coughs> CIPLA entered into an organization of the of production triangle of this sort with uh, quality chemicals in Uganda and the government of Uganda. Uh, CIPLA provided, as I've indicated, uh, patents and know-how and assistance. <coughs> the local manufacturer provided the plant and the government offered uh, money and commitment to buy the drugs in question, and it worked. Okay, that's number two of our five recommendations. Number three is um, one should try to organize local production initiatives, not necessarily within individual developing country, developing countries, but within regional economic communities of which there are several in the world today. These are the global regional economic communities. Uh, these are the eight that are in place already in Africa, as you can see, overlap significantly. Uh, <clears throat> we should use them when um, increasing uh, local production. Why? Because they have similar disease footprints and therefore they are typically, they need the same drugs or vaccines. They offer economies of scale. So if you look on the right-hand side of the slide, you see the number of people in each of the communities. With the exception of CARICOM, there's a lot in each of these countries. And so uh, they offer the crucial economies of scale to keep costs down in production. There are no impediments to the transportation of supplies and finished products across borders within these units and finally governance structures are already in place for example in the eight african organizations to uh, decide and implement equitable sharing of facilities and jobs which is often a delicate political issue so think regionally is the third of our five recommendations the fourth of our recommendations is apprenticeships so as I mentioned at the outset, uh, many of the presentations yesterday focused on the mechanics of tech transfer. How exactly do we ensure that local manufacturers in developing countries uh, have the skills necessary to uh, produce drugs locally? The immediate challenge is how do we ensure that they have the skills necessary to produce and RNA vaccines, um, but the longer term issue, which is our primary focus today, is how in general do we get tech transfer? Um, so in addition to the various practices uh, discussed yesterday, for example, by professors Price and Rye, um, we propose um, apprenticeship. So apprenticeship is a very long standing way of transmitting technical knowledge. Um, it was used in the early industrial era, era um, uh, extremely often, and uh, its usage has continued in the modern era um, in fields that are quite technologically dense. Uh, so, for example, uh, in the United States and in many other countries, surgery is basic or complex surgery is taught through an apprenticeship model. Uh, and in Germany, um, the pharmaceutical industry relies heavily on apprenticeship to uh, transfer technology. So our recommendation is that we build on this model to um, increase uh, local production and specifically that innovative pharmaceutical firms could be and should be required to accept apprentices from generic firms in, developed, in developing countries to teach them in their plants how to implement the technology at issue. This would have no adverse impact on production volumes in developed countries. So organizations like Moderna have often objected to the proposal that they engage in tech transfer on the grounds that uh, they're busy producing the vaccines that are going to save the world, um, to which our response is, 
we don't want you to change your current practices. We just want you to include in your plants um, technicians from generic firms in developing countries who can watch and ultimately participate and then learn and then take their knowledge back to the uh, countries from which they came where they could be implemented more effectively. <clears throat> so uh, how could we persuade pharmaceutical firms to um, participate in this process? Well, we could ask them to do so, but if they refuse, so there are two levers. One is African governments could require pharmaceutical firms to participate as one condition for permitting clinical trials to be conducted in their countries, which are extremely common. And uh, if the pharmaceutical firms want to continue to exploit this resource, uh, they should be obliged to uh, teach the uh, relevant <clears throat> technicians how to practice their technologies. And the second lever um, mentioned yesterday is the Biden administration could require participation in such a program in lieu of um, either exercising Biden margin rights or, as um, Professor Kaczynski indicated, uh, declining to file suit for patent infringement, which is currently available as an option vis-a-vis -vis Moderna. Okay, that's our fourth recommendation, apprenticeships. Um, finally, coordination with quality assurance. If local production is not accompanied with careful attention to the maintenance of quality, it will be discredited rapidly. It's crucial that the quality of drugs produced locally be maintained. Now, to some extent, this will happen automatically. But one of the reasons why substandard drugs flourish in Africa and Latin America, for example, is stockouts meaning that uh, pharmacies frequently run out of essential drugs. And when they do so, they turn to um, the black market and uh, significant portions of the black market are contaminated with substandard falsified drugs. So shifting production to um, local manufacturers should reduce those stockouts, minimizing transportation time, minimizing customs and borders impediments, and maximizing efficient distribution systems. Uh, and so naturally, the, the ubiquity of um, falsified and substandard drugs should diminish, but you can't rely on that alone. Uh, there are too many unscrupulous operators in the distribution networks. So we also need from the beginning to accompany local production, regular plant inspections and post-marketing surveillance to prevent the uh, invasion of the distribution chain by um, falsified and substandard drugs. So for this purpose, uh, Professor Okedici and I, um, <clears throat> along with Professor Margot Bagley at Emory University and uh, Padmarshi Gil Sampath at University of Johannesburg had been uh, working on and piloting a uh, project to explore the feasibility of uh, one particular method of post-marketing surveillance that could be deployed in conjunction with local production. <clears throat> so in my remaining time, I'm gonna summarize how this system works and then close. So there, this initiative called the Southern African Quality Assurance Network, SACON, is a collaboration among um, these folks uh, organized at, um, under the auspices of Global Access and Action at Harvard. Uh, MEDS, which is a um, <clears throat> uh, distribution and quality assurance organization, a, a faith-based organization in uh, Nairobi, and the principal participant is Nelson Mandela from that organization. Uh, the ministries of health and the participating countries, and thus far we've been working with the governments of Namibia and Malawi, and um, <clears throat> finally, InnoSpecta, which is a manufacturer of near-infrared scanners um, in Taiwan. So uh, putting these pieces together, here's the um, technology that we have developed collaboratively. 
It involves a combination of a near infrared scanner, uh, generic Motorola smartphone, custom software uh, developed originally by Global Good, an offshoot of the Gates Foundation, uh, a database, a library of profiles of authentic medicines that has been created and maintained by meds in Kenya. <clears throat> and here's how it works. An inspector takes this combination of devices into the field, turns on the gizmo, places a pill um, along the top, selects on the phone the type of drug that the pill purports to be, uses a camera to photograph the camera in the phone, to photograph the packaging, places the pill on the scan head, and presses scan. And what you get is either a green or a red indicator, either verifying the authenticity of the um, drug in question or not. So um, <clears throat> the records of these scans are then downloaded and aggregated, uh, creating a map of hot spots where um, flows of substandard falsified drugs are concentrated and uh, shared among the ministries of health in the participating countries. So we've done training of uh, health inspectors in the uh, relevant countries. This is Namibia, this is uh, Malawi, and uh, field testing. Uh, so with the inspectors, we've gone uh, into the field and then randomly selected pharmacies have um, tested uh, drugs uh, with uh, <clears throat> nervous uh, pharmacists looking on as we uh, did so, and have um, located some falsified drugs, a particular batch of substandard medicine drugs in a central facility in Namibia. So uh, it turns out it works. Uh, so this system is fast, inexpensive, um, the speed, scope, and data network enable intelligent and flexible surveillance, uh, and it generates data that can be used both to purge the healthcare system of falsified drugs and to uh, inform the procurement process going forward. Finally, um, one of the conditions of participating in the pilot is that each country agree to share with the other participating countries the data, something they are generally reluctant to do, which means that we are at least in a position to create a um, continent-wide uh, database. So to review, um, our argument is that the local production of pharmaceutical products in Africa and other developing countries is demonstrably now a good idea that the tradition of debate about whether it's meritorious has now been resolved in favor of doing going forward. And we recommend as tactics to achieve that outcome, five, the five things listed on your screen, clearing legal space, organizing production triangles of pharmaceutical firms, generic manufacturers and national governments, working with the already existing regional economic communities, using a apprenticeship system for tech transfer, and finally, marrying uh, local production initiatives with uh, augmented quality control. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Professor Fisher. Uh, it's great to hear uh, uh, your uh, keynote based on your um, paper. And um, um, I read your paper uh, in April and May this year. And uh, at that time, I had a hard time writing my uh, patent uh, philanthropy paper. And uh, I, I was not sure whether I was working on the right paper, whether the proposal was feasible or not. But after reading uh, you know, this paper, I was greatly inspired. I got a lot of clues and, and I was determined to finish it. So uh, thank you so much. And uh, so uh, time for um, uh, Q&A. So I wanna ask, uh, first of all, I wanna ask a question. and. So it seems to me that um, um, uh, this, uh, you know, this uh, of course this great uh, proposal is great, but it seems to me that um, um, it's a question more or less a question of whether pharmaceutical companies would be willing to participate. And um, so, I, 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 if I recall correctly, uh, in your paper you 
already mentioned that uh, you know something that we we should encourage uh, pharmaceutical companies to participate. Um, you mentioned several suggestions how we can encourage them them to participate. But I I, I wish to ask for a uh, a little bit more thoughts. Uh, you know uh, uh, about how we uh, should encourage or even <laughs> compel pharmaceutical companies to uh, participate in this uh, grant proposal. It's a crucial and delicate question. The most um, optimistic of the strategies contemplates that if we create conditions that are favorable to the deployment of local production, firms will participate voluntarily as they have sometimes in the past. And uh, some of the tactics that um, Professor Okedeji and I propose are designed to make conditions as attractive as possible to encourage voluntary participation. But um, we can't count on that. And so one of our purposes in identifying these tactics is to locate levers to uh, nudge or force the firms to participate. Uh, uh, the levers can come um, in, from two sides. One, the more traditional, is um, the power that developed country governments have to uh, condition the massive aid they provide to um, pharmaceutical firms uh, on participation in initiatives of this sort. So the March in rights associated with the Bayh-Dole Act, mm -hmm. um, the uh, uh, power to um, either press forward or to hold back patent infringement suits as uh, Professor Kaczynski indicated yesterday, um, the um, ability to invoke um, the uh, Defense Act, as also Professor Kapczynski indicated, those are all ways in which leverage could be brought to bear from developed countries if they had the will. And on the other side of the lever, we should not neglect the fact that um, the developing countries have a tool, and that tool is that they provide people for the clinical trials. And uh, the pharmaceutical firms are interested in maintaining access to that. You cannot conduct a clinical trial in a country without the permission of its government and the governments of the developing countries could um, insist upon tech transfer as a condition for access to their populations. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so uh, there's a question from Laura. Um, her question uh, deals with uh, the role of WHO uh, in uh, how WHO could uh, contribute to uh, this proposal. So uh, the question goes like this, do you think uh, the World Health Organization has a role to play in the education portion of your proposal? More broadly, do you envision a role for the WHO in fostering local production? So Malavi actually asked, uh, asked a similar question about the role of WIPO. Um, so would you like to address the, the uh, you know, uh, uh, WHO first, or would you like to respond to the, you know, put them together and, uh, you know, respond to both questions? Um, I'm happy to respond to both together. And hello, Laura, nice to uh, encounter you again in this wonderful setting. Um, so first, with respect to WIPO, I was struck yesterday by um, Director Kwakwa's um, contention um, generous um, uh, proposal that uh, WIPO um, fund increased education in developing countries, Africa in particular, um, concerning how one um, assembles and implements a balanced, using his term, um, patent system. That's exactly what Ruth and I are doing in our uh, patent X initiative. Um, we've created a set of 12 recorded lectures and an entire curriculum designed to teach a balanced patent system. And we did it in order to, primarily, in order to um, augment education in developing countries. So we would be eager to collaborate going forward with WIPO if they were willing to put up some 
uh, funds to enable us to recruit some more teachers and increase education. Now, with respect to the WHO, this is tricky. Um, the WHO has been in the past and sometimes very helpful and sometimes unreliable uh, participant in um, initiatives of this sort. And in particular, the assistance we've gotten for uh, the construction of our database on substandard and falsified drugs in Sub-Saharan Africa has been uneven from WHO. Well, WHO is um, subject to a lot of political pressures. So the bottom line is I'm uncertain concerning the degree to the, which the WHO can participate. It would be great if they did, but I am leery of putting too much weight on that uh, iceberg. Okay, uh, let's move on to the next question from uh, Professor Calvin Ho. Um, he asked uh, that uh, Professor Fisher's approach may be workable for simple uh, molecules. However, the, the production and regulation of complex biological products are likely to be uh, beyond the capacity of many uh, uh, you know, developing countries or related re regional economic groupings. Does their, uh, does their model in any way incentivize private pharma companies and their host countries to collaborate and share? This has, as I understand, has been WHO's main approach. Um, another good, difficult question. Um, there is, as Professor Ho, I think, rightly acknowledges, a spectrum uh, in terms of um, difficulty of manufacture from one extreme, um, simple, um, small molecules to the opposite extreme, um, complex biologics, and indeed many traditional vaccines, which are hard to produce because they involve biological foundations. In between, as we heard yes, learned yesterday, is the mRNA production systems, which are actually not as complicated as the um, as many of the biologic. So, our proposal in this paper is that the mechanisms we identify could be most easily and rapidly deployed with respect to um, drugs that are relatively easy to produce. And then gradually the initiatives should encompass more and more complex ones. Bearing in mind that uh, there already exist in Africa um, remarkably sophisticated plants. So we're not, it, it's a misleading to, as I'm sure this is not true of Professor Ho, but many commentators in this area seem to assume that the production systems are um, primitive. They're not. And in South Africa, Senegal, and Egypt, for example, those three, there are quite impressive technologies already in place that don't need to be radically improved in order to launch ventures of this sort. Thank you, Terry. Um, I wonder whether Professor Okadji would like to add some thoughts and respond to the questions we just um, had on the table. Thank you so much. I, I think Terry's answered um, um, all the questions and indeed his last response I posted also in the chat to uh, Professor Ho. So perhaps in the interest of time, we should uh, move on to additional questions. I think you've got quite a bit in front of you. I do want okay. to I, I think one point about long-term resilience. As Terry and I have been, especially Terry, traveling to the continent, um, meeting with government officials and, um, and agencies and working with some international um, organizations, I think what's become clear is, and, and I'm so grateful for the focus of this conference, is that what we need is long-term resilience and the capacity for autonomous um, space for governments to respond very quickly using a, combina a combination of levers to address access uh, um, and distribution um, and to create an enabling environment domestically or regionally more importantly, so that we have the scale um, uh, to really respond um, with expediency. That means that a variety of these mechanisms um, will need to be deployed 
uh, depending on the various conditions um, in the regional economic uh, communities. You know, when you think, for example, about TRIPS flexibilities, these are national, not regional. The coordination costs are quite significant. Um, and the learning steep is pretty high. So one, one thing that is a low hanging fruit that, that I've been thinking about is the possibility of regional exceptions and limitations. Things that might reduce the coordination costs for actually making use of the existing flexibilities. The second possibility with Jerry Reichman and I have talked about at length over the years is the idea of a mandatory approach to flexibilities with, res with regard to public health and access to medicines. As we know, one of the big challenges with the existing slate of flexibilities is that they are not mandatory, that there, there are often the national or um, equivalents of preemptive arrangements for countries not to use these flexibilities in addition to the normal range of pressures. So I, I think there's work that could be done that is low hanging fruit um, that would enable um, much of the work that Professor Fisher and I have been doing um, to um, uh, scale up um, and to be speedier. Thank you, Professor Okadiji. Um, so we have um, uh, just a little bit more time for one more question. And uh, I would like to pick a question from the Q&A box. Um, this is a question from my uh, current PhD student, Eric, because uh, Eric uh, assisted me on my paper and it, he also read your paper and he was greatly inspired. So he's asked, uh, he's asked a question uh, about this. Well, efforts to ensure that uh, ensure there are adequate markets for locally produced medicines provide a sufficient financial draw to encourage a shift away from the current focus on producing global drugs that serve the world's largest and richest markets. Yes, if the local manufacturer can credibly commit to producing the drugs at affordable prices. There have been some uh, bad experiences in the past, in Ghana, for example, when um, the local manufacturers have been inefficient and the commitments by the government to buy the drugs from them rather than say from Indian or Chinese generic manufacturers have driven costs way up. So it's crucial that local manufacturing be efficient, uh, but for the reasons that we've identified, that can be done. Now, in this one respect, there is a uh, advantage in the structure of the healthcare systems in most developing countries. In the majority of the countries of which we're concerned, it's the government that's the primary purchaser of drugs. It's the national health service and the public health sector that buys drugs. And that means that the government, understanding the long-term advantages, as Ruth has exactly rightly emphasized, of local production, can commit to um, long-term contracts with local manufacturers. But to say it one more time, if the local manufacturers are able to produce at um, more or less competitive prices. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Fisher and Professor Alcadiji. Um, um, it, as I mentioned, and I am again, greatly inspired by the talk. So um, uh, I'm sure the panelists uh, have, or, have already been greatly inspired to give more talks uh, today uh, for the remaining of the today's program. So uh, I can't wait to start the following panel. So let me invite uh, Professor Rochelle Dreyfus to start this panel. Rochelle?